I wanted you to hear what some of this music sounds like before I actually start talking about it. This is known as a roller organ. What's happening is that the little cylinder there is turning, and this little spike stuck into it, and that, of course, opens the valves here. And behind each one of these valves is what is known as a free reed. That means that one end of the reed is fastened and the other end is vibrating to make the music. The, uh, the song is actually wrapped around this cylinder about three times, and the cylinder gradually moves across and plays the song. This is a player piano. Unfortunately, bad quality. Remember that quality when I talk about it later. It's playing the Hallelujah Chorus. I'm just going to play a little bit of each one of these songs just to give you an idea of what it sounds like. This song is known as the Moor Beer Polka. More beer, and we bang our glasses down, and we shout, more beer, and our troubles all will drown. That's enough. Now, that was a player piano, but this is known as ragtime and honky tonk. Honky tonk is where you either put a thumbtack in the felt of each hammer, so when the hammer hits the string of the piano, it makes this rather tinny little sound. Feel a little bit of that. This is a player reed organ. What you're hearing right now is pumping to create the vacuum, which actually drives the organ. Once again, this is created by the use of the free reed, with the air being pulled across the reed. The reed vibrating, the air column vibrates, goes into a soundboard, and creates the sound. This is the roll of paper here, which is doing that, and these are known as stops. Just like in a regular organ, stops create different voices for the organ. This is a Nickelodeon, somewhat like a player piano, also uses a roll of paper to control it, but has additional things like snare drums, cymbals, xylophones, things like that. And as a Nickelodeon, they typically had a coin box that you drop a little coin in to go make them work, and it would have several songs on a roll, and you would have these in a restaurant or something like that to provide entertainment, or even a song. Uh, drop your magic nickel in in the Nickelodeon. Finally, the Opus One, which some of you will be seeing on Wednesday when you go on a trip, a day trip, if you stop by Trinity Church here in New York. We'll hear more about the Opus One later. Uh-oh. <laughs> I should have stopped. <laughs> well, we'll let it go in the background. It's okay. This is my, this is my uh, talk about player pianos. I'm actually going to stop it. And we'll just start it again. It's just a little annoying to me anyway. Okay, this is about player pianos or pianolas and free software or correlation. Now I'm gonna bring a little bit of loose stuff to this, okay? Because although, although I do like collecting these, I'm not a serious collector. You know, I only have about seven or eight of these instruments in my house. Uh, serious collectors have a serious number of instruments and are very serious about the whole thing, but I'm not. We're gonna go back in time a little bit back before the days of um, automated musical instruments. People have always loved making music, you know, drums or flutes or things like that. Some people think the string instruments came about because somebody had a bow and arrow and they twanged the bow and the string vibrated. They said, ooh, it makes a sound. That's kind of cool. And they kept making it you know, more and more sophisticated. And then finally, they developed something called the harpsichord, a wonderful instrument that you would make the strings vibrate by plucking them and he had a keyboard to do it. Then about 1703, a person in Florence, Italy, by the name of Cristofori, made another instrument. And Cristofori was an instrument maker, made a lot of 
different instruments. And uh, he, he invented this new instrument. But the problem was it was a very expensive instrument to make. And there was no music for it. No music, no demand. No demand, no people to buy the instrument. No people to buy the instrument, no music for it. Catch 22. And he said, geez, I could patent this instrument, make a lot of money, except nobody's going to buy it. That's a problem. Hmm. And people say, well, you know, patents didn't exist then. Oh, yes, they did. Actually, patents existed since the year 1300 in Florence, Italy. The written patent was in use since 1300 in Florence, Italy. They well understood what a patent was. So what should he do? What should he do? He finally decided he was going to publish how to make this instrument. Because after all, if other people were making it, it didn't make any difference to him. He was the inventor of this instrument. People would naturally come to him if they wanted the very best of these instruments. And he'd still make lots of money. So he tried to find people in Italy who would publish how to make this instrument, but nobody did. So finally he went to Germany, and he found some German publishers who published exactly how to make the instrument. And all these German instrument makers looked at this and said, yeah, we can make those. And they started making them, and they gave away a few samples. And you may have heard of, you know, to musicians of the day, and you may have heard of a couple of these people, you know, Brahms and Beethoven, Mozart, because the instrument that... Cifarelli uh, made the one the instrument that, unlike the harpsichord, they could only play loud because the harpsichord plucked the string and then let it go. You could only play it loud. This instrument, you could play both loud and soft. Piano and forte. Piano forte for the piano. That was the instrument that Cifarelli invented in 1703. And if he had tried to patent it, we might never have had the piano forte. Because even with this procedure, even with him giving away the idea, even with these people giving away the instruments, it still took almost 100 years for the piano to replace the harpsichord as an instrument in the orchestra. So the piano really isn't as old as a lot of us think. Now, in the 1830s, in most of the United States, there was reed organs. Reed organs were really, really popular because they were relatively inexpensive to buy. If you bought a piano from the Sears Roebuck catalog, it would cost about $300. But you could buy a really nice reed organ for only $30. Now, of course, you could buy a pair of shoes for a dollar. You could buy a horse for like $4, right? So, you know, everything in general, but in relative. But, you know, reed organs were a lot cheaper than pianos, about one-tenth the price. And this was the, or this was the instrument that Every nice young girl would learn to play, okay? Because this is the way that she was going to get the big, strong man. <laughs> I know. This is really ridiculous. I'm sorry. But, you know, this is the way they thought back then, okay? This is how to get the really big, strong man to take them as their wife and give them the nice, strong, li the wonderful living they have for the rest of their life. So they learned how to play these in the parlor, and they'd invite the young men in to hear them play and stuff, you know? And mostly it's religious music, you know, you know? all these religious music and stuff. This is what they had. Or church music and stuff. And, uh, and the churches loved these reed organs too because they were relatively temperature resistant. So you could lower the teat in your church and they wouldn't be warped out of shape. If you take a piano with the, with the harp that's in the back of most pianos and you, you take it through different temperature changes like winter to summer or even cold of night to warm of day, you can actually warp the entire harp with all the strings and, and break the piano. So you have to keep the piano at a relatively even temperature. But reed organs, eh, doesn't make any difference because as the reed expands and contracts, it just goes back to the same length, the same temperature. It's great. And they even had portable reed organs, little ones that could fold up. But during World War I and World War II, they would have these little reed organs go out and the, uh, the chaplains would pay, play them and people would sing the music and everything like that. And here's some of the inner workings of the reed organ, a relatively simple mechanism, okay? You had the little reed right here that would be vibrating, and the, the key would lift, would be force up the, the pallet to allow the air to go past and everything. And so it's a simple mechanism. And then the stops gave different voices. By making different reeds and different ways that the air moved through the system, you could actually have it sound like different wind instruments. You even had very large and fancy reed organs. Now, you see pipes here, but this isn't a pipe organ. Those pipes don't work. They simply put those pipes there to make it look like a more expensive pipe organ, you know. 
And uh, they were all just decorative. But you can see it, it did have three manuals, three keyboards, and they did work. And you, had, you see all the numbers of stops here. And sometimes these instruments might have hundreds, 400, 500 different reeds in there that would make the different sounds. So they could be quite complex. Now, the difference between a reed organ and a pipe organ, other than the pipe organ has pipes and the reed organ has reeds, is that the pipe organs typically have a blower that blows the air into the pipes, and reed organs create a vacuum by pumping them, which sucks the air over the reeds. So we say that reed organs suck and pipe organs blow. <laughs> now, all of this, of course, was without any type of automation. So if we're going to take you back in time to, say, 1880 or something like that, there were no radio, there was no phonographs around. Edison didn't do the phonograph till sometime later, and certainly was no surround sound or five channel, seven channel, any of that type of stuff. It was even before eight tracks. I didn't think anything was before eight tracks. There were music boxes and roller organs like we've seen, but, you know, yeah, I mean, they, they only played like one or two songs on them and stuff. And the cylinders that had most music boxes had or roller organs had were relatively expensive to produce. So these things really didn't, weren't that popular. Uh, here's an example of the end of a, of a roller. And you can see the number of little pins that had to be jammed into them. And he even, he even had instructions written on the back to make sure you put it in the roller organ the right way. Now, in 1880, the first player piano was created. Now, they used a piece of uh, paper roll, a soft, you could think of it as software going across. And then, the, again, the foot-powered powered bellows that sucked the air through the system. And as the, as the paper ran across a bar that had holes in it, then the air would break, the vacuum would be broken, and then a series of bellows and things inside would actually make the keys work. Now, this was not a major success at the beginning because the piano had 88 keys to it, a standard piano, and these, these rolls only had 56 holes in it. So in, in terms of software, we would say that this didn't meet minimum needs for functionality, okay? And relatively few player pianos were created between the period of um, actually, this is wrong, 1860 and 1880. It was the, the piano player was first created in 1860. And here's a, a picture of, of one of the rolls. You can see relatively big holes and stuff like that. And, uh, just, but in 1890, a major breakthrough happened. What became known as the standard 88-note player piano. And there was, you know, a standard was created of how far apart the holes were going to be, how big they were going to be, how they go along the, the length of it. There was actually 89 holes in it because one hole was used for the sustain pedal. And there was a bellows that guided this. And one of the problems that they had that before was trying to guide this piece of paper precisely over the roller bar so that the holes all lined up. But they, they figured out that they could use a bellows to force it back and forth and keep it in alignment, and that way they could have the holes smaller and closer together. So this is a picture of, of my player piano. This is a Beckwith, Beckwith player piano. Beckwith actually was manufactured by the Sears Roebuck Company as a brand name. And there's all sorts of parts to this. I mean, the keys. And then this was a board that flipped down, and you would have controls for tone and loudness and speed and things like that. Um, I'll show you more of the, the rest of this, but here's the roller mechanism right here, and this is actually a little vacuum engine. We'll see this in closer detail in a moment. So this is the reed head and feedback mechanism. Okay, so up here, you would have the roll of paper that would be coming down here to this take-up spool, and here's the bellows that actually guides this back and forth and keeps it aligned. You have little fingers on either side here that run alongside the paper. So if the paper goes a little bit too far to one side, a valve opens, and the bellows moves this thing back to pull it back in the opposite direction. If the paper goes too far in the other way, then the other finger opens up, the first finger closes, and it gets pulled back with the bellows. So it's just a feedback mechanism guiding it across. Now here is the reed head and the bus lines coming back. This is the reed head up here, and these are rubber tubes coming down to a whole series of little bellows that actually make the keys work. And so for every hole, there's a rubber tube, and, and you know, for, even for the sustained key. 
So you can see it was a fair amount of work that went into making this thing. Here's the device driver. As I said, we have the vacuum tube motor, the vacuum motor over here. It has a combination crankshaft and valve shaft there. And there's a valve that slides up and down, which controls the air going in and out of the bellows. And then the bellows act like pistons that f uh, turn the crankshaft. And then that goes into this, which is uh, gearing that makes it either go forward to allow the piano roll to unwind or reverse to allow the piano roll to rewind with the motor going in the same direction. And then down at the bottom, you have the server system, which is the two foot pedals which you pump with two large bellows on either side to create the vacuum. Of course, with every system, you have to have accessories, highly expensive accessories sold to you by the system vendor, okay? And here we are. This, this is a little bellows here because these paper rolls sometimes have little chads stuck in them, not unlike Florida voting systems. Little chads stuck in them that get stuck in the head, in the reed head. So you have to suck those little chads back out using a vacuum, okay? And of course, I'll sell it to you at an astounding rate. And this is, the, this is the minimal vacuum here, which is sold for 75 cents. And this is the super deluxe one that's sold for $1.75. Remember, you could buy a whole nice pair of shoes for a buck, okay? <laughs> this is the official motor graphite. Now, I know you think you might be able to use other graphite, but this is the official motor graphite and costs about six times more than any graphite you get from any other source. Here's the official polish for your piano that is just astronomically expensive as opposed to any of polish, but of course you want to buy that. And then there's the instruction manual, which nobody ever read. <laughs> It hasn't changed. <laughs> now, between 19, 1890 and 1930, 2.5 million player pianos were created in the United States alone. Now, this is really impressive, considering the fact that there weren't that many people living in the United States. I mean, between that period of time, we had, you know, like a quarter of our states weren't even states yet. So this is really a huge number of, in of instruments that are going out, and it's because this was, this was how you could dance with your girlfriend, okay? And again, you have to imagine this in your mind. You're in Kansas. You're in Kansas. There's, there's no radio. There's no TV. None of this stuff exists. And, and you can't play an instrument of any type, nor can anybody in your family, okay? And you like to dance with your girlfriend. So you open up your Sears Roebuck catalog, and inside this player piano. And you order it. And someday the postman shows up carrying this thing on his back. Okay, I'm just kidding you, Okay because it shows up in a freight wagon. But it's delivered to you, they move it into your house, and now you can get your little brother or sister to face the wall, not look at your girlfriend and you, <laughs> face the wall and pump this thing like crazy, and you can play songs. Well, the whole family could sit around this and sing Christmas carols and stuff like that. It was wonderful. This was the toasted town. Now, here's the importance of the 88-note standard. Before the 88-note standard came out, lots of vendors made rolls. And... But the rolls were different sizes and only play on the piano that came from that vendor. But when the 88 note standard came out, it allowed all these different vendors to create you know, different rolls and they would all play on different pianos. So you could accumulate a huge collection of music from this. Now, inside of this standard, you could still innovate because remember those little fingers? Well, sometimes those little fingers got stuck. Sometimes those little fingers need lubrication. Sometimes the felt on the little fingers leaked. They were really terrible. But later on, somebody got the bright idea, we don't need little fingers. All we need to do is have a hole on either side, an additional hole in the tracker bar on either side of the paper. If the paper moves too far to the left or too far to the right, one of those holes becomes uncovered, and the bellows does the same thing. And so we can eliminate having to create those little fingers, the felts, the little rocking mechanisms and stuff. We had innovation or still using the same standard. And likewise, the people that made the rolls could innovate because you could use either very cheap paper and a cheap paper ending you know, for it, or you could have really expensive paper and expensive endings. Now, why would you want to have the expensive paper and the expensive endings? It's because it's a song you're going to be using for years and years and years. You want the paper to last a long time. It's a Christmas carol. It's, 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 it's a song you really want to hear over and over again. Or you're in a church and you want to play the same, you know, the, the, the same hymn over and over. 
But that song you only want to hear once in a while, you download it from iTunes. Oh, no, no, you, you, you get the paper that's really cheap and the cheap paper endings. You, hear, you play it a couple of times, that's it. You sell it to somebody else. You don't care. So these are things that you could have innovations. Now, sometimes the innovations didn't make very much sense. You look at the back of the player piano, you're going to repair it, and you see something and you say, why in the world did they do something that stupid? I don't understand why they did something that stupid. That's really an ignorant way of doing that. And then all of a sudden, it occurs to you. You say, Cifarelli didn't patent the original piano. But if you look in the back of any piano, even today, you'll see a list of patents all the way down. This is patented, this is patented, this is patented, this is patented. And the reason that person put that stupid thing in there was to get around one of those patents. So they purposely made the piano worse than they could have because they didn't want to pay the royalty on that patent, or the patent was blocking them from using a much better technique. It hasn't changed. <laughs> now, the reed organ people who manufactured these started to fight back, because remember, there was two and a half million player pianos created in that period of time? Well, before that, SD Corporation in Vermont had generated 500,000 reed organs, other, and that was just one of the larger ones. I mean, there were millions and millions of reed organs out there, and they tried to fight back, but the problem was reed organs were positioned as being passé. You know, nobody wanted a reed organ anymore. They, they were as cheap things. You wanted a piano because they cost a lot more money, and they had a much larger margin on the, on the pianos. And they, shiny, shiny logos, absolutely. But you can see that this is a player reed organ. As a matter of fact, it's a Wilcox and White Symphony player reed organ, 455 different reeds in it, and 13 different stops that you can pull out to make all sorts of things, including a harmonic human voice, vibrating like that. Really cool. Now, I told you about the 88-note standard piano, but unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be, there is another type of piano called the reproducer. The problem with the 88-note standard is either the key was hit or the key was not. There was no in-between. Now, if you play a keyboard instrument of any type, you know that that's not exactly how you play it. You have a certain amount of attack and a sustain on the key. You can hit it lightly. You can hit it heavily, stuff like that. You could somewhat duplicate this, even with the 88-note standard, by pumping slowly or loudly or hitting the loudness button. But it just wasn't. You, you could tell the difference between a 88-note standard player piano and if a human being, particularly a good human being, was playing the piano. So they came along and they, they created something called the reproducer. And the reproducer had about 50% more holes in the paper, which allowed you to completely duplicate what the person was playing. And it had about 50% more parts, and it cost about 50% more money than the standard player piano. And there were about four vendors, four different vendors that made these reproducers. Unfortunately, they also made different holes and different, you know, and some of, the, some of them specialized in jazz and some specialized in classics and some specialized in honky-tonk. And, and so you couldn't really get a whole library of music with these reproducers. You know, you could get a lot of music, but it was kind of like the RAII is today, where if you own a restaurant, you actually have to pay royalties to three different organizations so that you could play all music in your restaurant. Yes, it's true. Um, and the, basically, the public rejected them for the most part because they didn't see the extra value for getting this. For most people, the 88-note standard was good enough. And it was also hard to find service because you, you always had to go back to the person who made that piano to get the parts and stuff like that. So you can think of reproducer pianos as proprietary. Then in 1930, the Depression hit. And all of a sudden, people couldn't afford these pianos anymore. And most of the piano firms went out of business they never recovered because after the Depression came World War II, and by the time World War II was over with, you had radio, the beginnings of TV, the phonograph was well in, in, endeavored, and people didn't want to pay out the money for a player piano or to pay for the expensive, relatively expensive roles. And so a lot of the player pianos eventually migrated down to the basement where the leather bellows would rot and the rubber tubes would rot. Mice would get into them and build little nests and everything. And uh, speaking of that, mice. 
Yeah, my, my sort of devil and everything, you know. <laughs> but then about 1960, with all those hippies and the environmental movement and stuff, there was this revival because these things didn't use electricity. They were kind of funky. You sit there, you could, re, you know, you could repair them, and restoration began. And a lot of the companies that had gone out of business in making rolls went back into business. And you could get things like, you could get songs like Bridge Over Troubled Water and Peter, Paul, and Mary and, and Billy Joel's Piano Man put onto paper rolls to play on these pianos. From, you know, and then they started creating regular player pianos again. There was a company in Seneca, Pennsylvania that started producing new player pianos. But only the 88 note ones. Nobody was making new reproducer pianos. If you wanted to do a reproducer piano, you got one of these things from Yamaha that, that did the same thing on a CD, you know, but not the paper roll because they were simply too expensive. And to restore these old reproducer pianos in any type of volume was also expensive. And so it is with free software. We have great functionality for very low price. It's built on top of standards. We can innovate above and below those standards. And we can Im Im improve it without breaking the standards. Now, I'm going to do a little sidestep here because I have another interesting story to tell you. In 1938, war was on the horizon. And there was this person living in Austria who was very nervous because they were Jewish. And they decided that they were going to leave Austria and go to Great Britain for safety. They went there and they got involved with the movies. And after that, they left Britain and went to Hollywood. And they were in movies in the Hollywood. But they'd had a great deal of training in mathematics and science and stuff. Their father had been a mathematician and uh, their mother was actually uh, a, in, in music and uh, the arts. So they have really broad background. And they kept thinking about Hitler and his U-boats and how his U-boats kept sinking all these merchant marines and sinking the boats. So they said, there's got to be some way that we could, I could help with this. Now, they did have torpedoes back in those days, but the torpedoes were relatively slow, and they gave off little trails of bubbles. So it's easy for the U-boats to see where the torpedoes were going and avoid them. People thought about controlling the U-boats with radio. But the problem with that was if the Germans intercepted the radio broadcast, they would really know that the torpedoes were coming. And perhaps by jamming it, they could even turn the torpedoes back and sink the, the, the boat that had launched the torpedo. So this person got the idea of taking a little bit of the signal and putting it on different frequencies, making it very hard to detect. And if you kept doing this randomly, it made it also very, very hard to jam. And they, they, they had this idea, but they didn't know how to do it. And one day, they were in Hollywood at a... At a show, and this person had 16 player pianos up on the stage, where these 16 player pianos were all coordinated together playing this song. And some of them were playing one song, and some, uh, one part of the song, another part of the song, the different voices of the song. But this person was coordinating all of this using another piano roll. So they got together, and they formed a patent. And they said, by using a piano roll, we can control at any particular time, what part of the signal is on each one of these different frequencies? And they submitted this to the war office, gave them the rights to use the patent. And the war office looked at this and said, kind of an interesting idea, but we can't really put a piano roll in a torpedo and have another one you know, at the transmitter. So it's interesting, but we can't implement it with current day technology. Every once in a while, they dragged this patent out, look at it, eh, you know, vacuum tubes came and went, transistors came and went. And in the late 1950s, they started saying, you know, we could do this with transistors. We could put a synchronization unit in the torpedo and a synchronization unit at the radio and synchronize this. Not only that, because we could, we could put this in missiles and other things that we can guide with radio. And so from 1950s, particularly during the Korean War, to around 1976, this was still top secret. But in 1976, it was declassified, and there were certain manufacturers who looked at this and said, this is a great idea. We're going to use this for things like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cell phones, because this became the basis of spread spectrum technology that we use today. 
In the 1990s, the EFF found out about all of this and said, you know, the person that invented this was never, the two people actually that invented this was never properly rewarded for this. They never made any money off of the patent. They were never even given any recognition for this. In fact, the first person I told you about, after the government said, yeah, kind of an interesting idea, they said, well, I've got other ideas. Can I help you out with this? They said, no, 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 no. You're, you're not going to work with our scientists or anything because you're just a movie star. Why don't you do things like sell war bonds? Okay. They did sell war bonds. In fact, during one sale, one campaign of war bonds, they sold over $7 million worth of war bonds. Because this is a very famous person in their own right, very famous as a movie star. In fact, at one time, they were called the most beautiful woman in the world, Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar created the first rendition of spread spectrum technology. They found her in Florida, living almost in poverty, and they finally recognized her right before she died. Now, why should we preserve this as an art form? Well, once again, player pianos are falling out of favor. Most people find them too large for their homes. They don't think about it. They'll go out and they'll pay $6,000 for a new piano, but they won't restore an old antique piano, which may, they may get for free and spend another $2,000 to restore it to pristine condition. They won't restore one. They'll go for electronic keyboards and stuff like that, and a lot of times these pianos are just junked. And the paper rolls are falling apart because a lot of these rolls are created using paper that was washed in acid. And so over time, as moisture gets into the paper, they simply deteriorate and fall apart. The roll-making companies are once again going out of business. In fact, the last major one, QRS, has simply, uh, simply uh, stopped making rolls for right now. They say maybe we'll go back into business later on. But, but why should we be saving these? It's because these rolls were actually created by artists playing. Artists like Gershwin would sit down to a keyboard and actually make the rolls. And a lot of very famous people, their music is embedded in these rolls, even the 88 note ones. Now, we also have a lot of our sayings that come from these. Don't shoot the piano player. It's interesting that during the time that player piano started up, the musicians' union fought them like crazy because they said, you know something, player pianos are going to drive all professional piano players out of business. Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't happen, did it? I mean, it's hard to find a player, a player piano these days, but you still find plenty of people making a living playing piano live. We have some of our other sayings. Remember those buttons I showed you on the organ? Those are stops. If you push in all the stops and you hit the key on the organ, no sound comes out because there's no voice that's been selected. The more of them you pull out, the more voices you hear. So if you pull out all of them and pump really hard, you get this really loud, wonderful sound, a crescendo. This is known as pulling out all the stops. Another thing that happens is that in a, in a, in a, play, in a reed organ, is you, a particular player reed organ, is you have these two panels, these two panels down below, if you push them with your knees, in effect, you open up all the stops at one time. These are known as the swell. Again, it makes this really loud, grand sound. That's really swell. And finally, there's the concept of ragtime and honky-tonk, where if something is kind of a tinny, you know, kind of questionable thing. It's, it's kind of honky-tonk, you know? So recently, we've been looking at how to preserve these old paper rolls. And one way is to take them through a scanner, scan them, and turn them into MIDI. And now you remember all those rubber tubes that come down from the reed head. If you cut those rubber tubes in half and you stick a little valve in there and you connect those up to a MIDI controller, you can actually now play your MIDI sound files through a controller and have the piano actually play it. So this is not, this is not recording on an MPEG-3, the music, or anything, and playing it back is actually having the piano play the same music without having it go through a paper roll. And of course, it's nice because then you can use a MIDI keyboard to create new music that that particular instrument has never played before. 
And the other way of doing it, of course, is to play the existing role on your piano one time, record it as an MPEG-3 so you can play it back and people can listen to it. And I thought about doing this, and a lot of people in the organization I belong to, uh, the AMICA, have been doing this. But one day I started to, I, I started to feel the hackles in the back of my neck stand up, and I started to think about copyright. So I made sure that I was using a song that was way out of copyright, like Green Sleeves, an ancient English melody, completely out of copyright if it was ever in copyright. Sometimes we have to question about whether a song is in copyright. For example, Happy Birthday. <laughs> I know a lot of you may not know this, but Happy Birthday is actually in copyright. And if you sing it in a public place, you have to pay a royalty to the people that own the patent or the, the copyright on Happy Birthday. It's frightening. So I, I called up this company called QRS, and I talked to them. I said, you know, can I make an MPEG-3 out of an old, old roll with green sleeves? And they said, well, yes, it's true. Green sleeves was never copyrighted, you know. But the artist's rendition of green sleeves was, because in every music, of course, there's the actual music, the notes, the words, things like that. But the artist's rendition of it is something which is copyrightable. Think about Eric Clapton's Layla. Layla! You got me on my knees, Layla! My roommate played that song 457 times in a row when I was back in college until I finally went into his room, took the record off the record player, threw it on the floor and stamped on it like that. It was 10 years before I could listen to Layla again, okay? But then, one day, I heard something else on the radio. Layla, you got me on my knees. Layla, Layla unplugged, same words, same artist, different rendition, and yes, it was copyrighted. <laughs> so this is a problem too, is the artist's rendition. And then somewhere in ancient history, our Congress came forward with something known as the Phono Record Copyright Act of 1972 which somehow has warped time and space so that you can actually copyright something before it's written. I don't, I don't understand how it's done, and I don't really understand it because it's not that thick, but it's really scary. And so we both agreed, this guy from QRS and I, that if you took a song that was so ancient that nobody could have copyrighted it, on a roll made by a, 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 a piano company that was no longer in existence, and you only took 30 seconds of it, so somehow it fit inside of the Fair Use Act, and if you declared yourself as a nonprofit educational institution solely for the perversion, prevention and preservation of old music, that maybe you could get away with it. But please don't use a QRS roll, because he would hate to have to sue me. <laughs> Here it is. I don't take a chance, okay? Now, we're going to come forward to the modern day. September the 11th, 2001, the World Trade Center was in the process of collapsing. About a block from the base of the World Trade Center is this little church known as Trinity Church, very beautiful church. And that day, the organist was sitting in the church practicing on the organ as the World Trade Center was collapsing, didn't know. He heard about it, went running out of the church, but he left the blower on the church running, on the organ running. And what happened was they pulled in all this dirt and filth and asbestos and things like that. And the pipes, some of the pipes on a pipe organ are way smaller than your little finger in diameter. And these all got jammed with this dust and everything and basically destroyed the organ. They went out to look for an electronic organ temporarily. Now, I, I should also tell you that Trinity Church has been in existence a very long time. And as a church, they're fairly wealthy because they, have, they own a lot of land in New York City. This university, the land that this university is on, was donated by Trinity Church. And the other interesting thing is there's this walkway that goes between Trinity Church and Wall Street. It's up in the air, so you don't even have to go down to the street level to get from Wall Street to Trinity Church. So I figure what happens is the brokers on Wall Street go there at least twice a day. 
If the stock is dropping like a rock, they go there to pray. If their stock is raising like a, uh, like a, like a bullet and they sold short, they go there to pray, okay? So in either way, you know, the church wins. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's this company in Massachusetts named Marshall and Ogletree. And I, should, I should back up a little bit. When you have an electronic organ, there's basically two ways you can make one. You can synthesize the sound. And so you, you do mathematically a synthesis of the sound that makes it sound like an organ. But they're still working on that. They're still improving it. It doesn't really give a satisfying sound. The other way you do it is you sample the sound. So you go to a real organ, you hook a microphone up to the pipe, and you sample the sound. And, you know, you may sample it for like 15 seconds. And you sample one pipe, and then what you do is you simulate the two pipes next to it because you know what that one sounds like, so you can simulate the other two pipes. Well, that's what most companies do to create their database of sounds. Marshall and Ogletree sampled every single pipe in the organ. Some of these organs have 30,000 pipes. And Marshall and Ogletree didn't sample it just for 15 seconds. They sampled it for three minutes because it takes time for the air to come into the pipe and come to, to steady state to make the real sound. They created this database, and they did it not for just for one organ, but for 40 different organs around the world. So you go to one part of the database, you could be Notre Dame's organ. You go to another part of the database, you could be Winchester Cathedral's organ. You can actually mix the organs as you're playing. And they came and they said to Trinity, we'll create an organ for you, and we call it the Opus One. And as you can see, 240 different voices at one time and sampled for three minutes to create probably what is one of the world's best organs. So after they had put this together, in the process of putting this together, they actually tried to use Windows to support this. And they said, no, Windows is too unstable to support anything as important as an organ concert. Ten PCs with one as a hot standby. And they can monitor this organ over the Internet while it's playing. They can update it while it's playing. They can add new voices while it's playing over the Internet. This organ costs $5 million, has a 15,000-watt amplifier and two consoles like the one I showed you, like this one. Um, it's really a magnificent instrument. I went down there uh, this morning, and the, the associate uh, organist took me through and showed me some of the PCs that were there and the, the networking in the back. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this type of stuff. These are the actual amplifiers that amplify the music. This is the air conditioning system that they have in their closet where they put all this. And there is their PC where they can sit there and monitor it locally and Marshall and Ocletree can also monitor it remotely back at the factory. These are some of the old pipes, which they still have in there, some of the larger of the pipes. This is a ladder that can be used to go up and reach up towards the pipes. But I just thought I'd throw that in there so you can see the size of the original organ that they had. And then this is the steps that you have to go up. And I'm showing you the steps because if you go down there to see it on Wednesday morning at 10.30, if there's a large group of you, it may be difficult to get the large group up that tiny little set of staircases to see the actual mechanism. But we've set it up so that you can hear the organ, you can talk to the organist, and maybe somebody could actually play it. We don't know yet. With that, I'd like to thank the Debian team for putting together DebConf and Deb Day. And I'd like to thank especially Philip for helping me get in because I didn't realize I could, I could come here to the very last moment. And uh, Robert Ridgell is the associate uh, organist at Trinity Church. And I'd like to thank all of you for creating free software. Thank you very much. If you would like to hear a little bit more of the organ music, I do have one little video that I made this morning uh, with Robert, and it has a little bit of a demonstration of the Opus One.
Can you turn it up a little bit? That's as loud. That's as loud as I can get it. Oh. I'm scrolling through. Actually, there's no way that I could reproduce this instrument because I was just using the handheld um, camera to take it. You actually have to go down there because in the church. The church becomes part of the organ, okay? The certain notes vibrate the entire building. There's 15,000 watts, okay? So your microwave organ may be close to 1,000 watts, and it cooks hamburger in a matter of seconds. <laughs> no. It's really it's just an amazing instrument. And Marshall and Ogletree is now duplicating these instruments through many different churches, but only at a million dollars a piece. Trinity Church actually gives concerts, and organists come from all over the world to play this instrument. Uh, Cameron Carpenter, who is considered by some to be one of the best organists in the world today, lives here in New York City and plays these instruments. that They call them virtual pipe organs. A cute little story that went along with putting the Opus 1 in there in the first place was that they just installed it and uh, Marshall, Mr. Marshall of Marshall and Ogletree, was standing there as the organist from the church was playing the organ. And the organist sat down, started playing it and everything. And after a while, he just stopped and just sat there. And Marshall said, what's wrong? And the man was silent. Marshall says, is it OK? And the man turns around, tears are coming down his face. He says, this is the best organ I've ever played. And Marshall says, you mean the best electronic organ? The guy says, no, the best organ, period. And Trinity Church, who originally thought of this only as a temporary organ until they could find somebody that would build a real pipe organ, has now decided this is going to be their real pipe organ. Because how could they ever have an organ that would be better than this one? So I, I suggest, you know, if you want to, as part of your, your day out on Wednesday, Stop by the church on your way out. You can continue on to Coney, uh, Coney Island uh, after that and see it. And the, we've, we've set it up so that you can have a, a private showing. Thank you very much. <laughs>